So here we go. Diversity is a reality, but inclusion is a choice. And the reason you're having this event today is because we're hoping that you're going to choose inclusion. Not because it's the right thing to do, as we've heard, but because it makes incredible business sense. Let's just quickly rethink diversity. And in particular, I want to go over three points. Who knows who this chap is? If anybody gets this, they get an absolutely big prize. But this is Heraclitus. Heraclitus is a famous Greek philosopher who's most famous for the, getting the point across that nothing is permanent except change. And that, folks, was 2,000 years ago. So if he was around today, he'd probably be saying, no, uh, I really was right. <laughs> so I would put it across to you that the business case for doing this stuff can really be boiled down into five parts. And let me do it super quick, because you're super smart. Number one, customers. The world outside Alcon is moving faster than the world inside Alcon, by definition. And therefore, in order to keep up with that world, we need to bring as much of that world inside as possible. Secondly, for our employees. We have a great bunch of folks here, but we don't know what we don't know. And if we believe in the value of diversity and improving our collective intelligence, particularly if you want to maintain or enhance a beyond number one position, then you need to get that talent inside. And that talent won't come inside if it doesn't see people like them. Third reason for productivity. We know from numerous studies that people perform better when they can be themselves. And so for productivity alone, we need to have inclusive leadership. Gay people who can be out and not in the closet. Disabled people who can get to work and not worry about accessibility. Women who don't need to fear outdated sexist or chauvinist attitudes. These things are not the right thing to do alone. They are productivity prerequisites. And the fourth argument, I will bring in this chap. Anybody know who this is? Very good, Charles Darwin. And here he is, right here today. <laughs> so Darwin's famous for many things. One of them is a book called The Origin of Species and talking about how we got to be where we are. Now, whatever your views on evolution, the book is very, very interesting. And it basically says a simple thing, that in order to progress, to improve as a human species, we need diversity from which to select. There's a reason why the dinosaurs aren't with us today. I mean, there's a few dinosaurs kicking around in some parts of the economy, but generally speaking, the dinosaurs are gone. And there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why some companies are successful. Because they absolutely cultivate this idea of diversity from which to select the best, choose, improve, and progress. And this was written 200 years ago. So you might have thought, OK, this guy from Harvard's going to talk about the latest research. And so far, I've given you a bloke called Heraclitus, who's 2,000 years old, and then Charles Darwin. But these things are really worth pondering. And I'm happy to ponder more with you in Q&A on them. This is a, a snapshot from the Beijing Olympics in 2008. And I was there running the London operation as we tried to kind of work out how the heck to do this thing. And that's a picture of some of the one million volunteers that Beijing had. Wonderful people, kind, wonderful, and they could all tell you the answers to 10 questions. But if you were to ask an 11th question, you were on your own. And one of the reasons for that, I would argue, is a lack of diversity. Because there's a guy from University of Michigan called Scott Page who wrote a really interesting book called The Difference. And in that book, he puts forward a very basic equation. He's basically a recovering mathematician turned social activist. But th this equation he put forward was very simple and hopefully speaks to scientists and logical minds. That by definition, the definition of a right answer will be greatly improved if you can reduce the error through collective intelligence. So the crowd error is the average error, the area I or you or anyone would make alone, minus diversity. And if you ain't got diversity, you ain't reducing that error. I think reframing the conversation is important. And Christina spoke a little to this. Rather than trying to persuade each other why we should do this stuff, if you believe the business case, why wouldn't you? Don't lobby people as to why you should do this, but ask the question, why wouldn't you? If you view the world as a zero-sum game, I understand. But if you view the world as enlarging the pie, 
why wouldn't you do this? Because the thing is, folks, why we need to do what we're doing today is because this doesn't just happen. It only happens when people do stuff. So the first thing I'm talking about is think differently. But the second thing I want to put across to you is act differently. Here's a bunch of really, really smart people who are my colleagues, well, mostly smart, who were working on the Beijing uh, Olympics and Paralympics as well as the London ones. And here's a view we had of the VIP seats in the Paralympics, sitting down volleyball in the National Indoor Gymnasium in Beijing, August, September 2008. And here's my view of the action. Right? Very nice, little bouquet right over the centre court, VIP seats. Here's my colleague's view of the same action. He was a wheelchair user at the Paralympic Games. Kind of ironic. But the point is, it doesn't just happen. We've got to make it happen. Okay. Think differently. Act differently. I'm obviously trying to do something that's almost impossible here, which is to condense uh, five and a half years of Olympic work into 20 minutes. Um, and forgive me if uh, it's going a little fast, but I'll try and wrap up some thoughts in the next five minutes or so. Think differently, act differently. Let's rethink leadership. There are about 2,500 books on leadership currently on Amazon. I've read about 25 of them, which are not bad, but I don't know the rest, and I don't know whether they actually have anything to do with leadership. Because I think leadership, really for me, if we believe in a diverse world, is about bringing that diversity together to tackle problems. It's inclusive leadership. By definition, it's inclusive leadership. So again, not why you should, but why wouldn't you? And there's three ideas I'd like to discuss. Who knows who this woman is? She's called Sarah Attar. And she was the first woman from Saudi Arabia to run in the Olympic Games. And she came last by a long, long way in London 2012. But she got a standing ovation from the crowd, biased coverage from the commentator, and made history. The first woman from Saudi Arabia ever to run in the Olympic Games. That wasn't management. That was leadership. That was actually challenging a problem that exists and persuading a lot of other people to come on the journey too. Transparency versus confidentiality. A lot of us guard information. We have lots of lawyers to guard information. We have lots of IP, lots of rules and regulations and so forth. But actually within our own culture, how can transparency help us with inclusive leadership? And back to the idea of zero sum and enlarging the pie. If we can be honest about our prejudices and our biases and honest about our fears and so forth, we're much more likely to form relationships and bonds and respect and trust with colleagues than if we are the opposite, if we're guarding information. In order to enlarge the pie, you've got to give a little. And by giving a little and getting a little, you can actually both benefit rather than remaining in your silo. A third idea I'd like to get across in terms of action is this idea that it's not a solo endeavor. There is this traditional view of leadership as the heroic male enterprise, the hunter-gatherer still, the idea of the man going off and finding the answer and showing everyone the promised land. But it doesn't really work like that. Indeed, it's actually failed like that quite a lot in recent history. Leadership is a group process. And therefore, it's by working in a team that we together can advance the cause. That's why we have a team together to launch the inclusive leadership work here at Alcom. So in the remaining few minutes, I'd like to give you a quick snapshot of London 2012 and what we tried to do with the Games in London a couple of summers ago. Here's uh, myself with the great honor of introducing Desmond Tutu to our folks and our colleagues at London 2012. And the reason we invited Desmond Tutu over, as you saw a little bit in the video at the beginning, was to get across this idea that it doesn't just happen, but also that this isn't a zero-sum game. And Desmond Tutu said that we need diversity not so that we should accentuate our differences, but so that we should know our need of one another. And it went down quite well. We then intervened in three areas, in our workforce, in our procurement, and our service delivery, across a range of strands of diversity on the left-hand side. And again, this wasn't just about doing the right thing. This was about making the games better, hiring brilliant, diverse talent that would not otherwise want to work with us beyond the paycheck. 
How do you create that discretionary effort, unlock that discretionary effort, and really allow people to be themselves and give 100% to the games? In procurement, by making our supply chain as transparent as possible, not simply to reduce our costs and increase competition, sure, but also to source innovation and new ideas that we wouldn't otherwise access. Our torch and our cauldron, two of the highlights of the games, both came from our supply diversity program. Here's how we ended up in workforce. Anybody who knows the UK, about 10% ethnic minority in the UK, but 90% general Caucasian white. We ended up with 40% of our team being from ethnic minority backgrounds. Not because we were doing the right thing, but because we were doing things differently, and including diverse talent. 5% of our people identified openly as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. In a sporting environment, very rare. But again, it allowed people to really give everything they had to the games, to improve productivity, to increase loyalty and retention. In procurement, we ended up with some great results through being transparent, as I said, and online. Here's how we did. Again, not through charity or through token efforts, but 15% of our online contracts went to women-owned businesses. Women-owned businesses that were the best on all of the criteria, quality, value, time, quality, everything, but also happened to introduce new innovative ideas and products to the games that we otherwise might have missed. And in-service delivery, the customer, the ultimate boss in any business, how could we improve their experience of London 2012? How could we make London 2012 their London 2012? How could we make it everyone's 2012? And many of you will know our mascot. Uh, many things were written about the mascot. But um, whatever you think, it was diverse, it was inclusive, and it was the result of a very, very interesting creative process. We had some challenges on the way. This stuff is not easy, because if it was easy, we'd do it tomorrow. And you can see that we were challenged quite a lot. Was this politically correct? Was this increasing costs? Both of them, I would argue, wrong. But when you're upsetting the norm, you're going to get pushback. And it behaves the, the importance of inclusive leadership to try and have that conversation from moving from zero sum to enlarging the pie. And that's the responsibility of inclusive leadership and the work that you're engaged in from today onwards. Who here was able to see the opening ceremony a couple of seconds ago? So quite a few people. And a key part of the ceremony was when Sir Tim Berners-Lee, one of the inventors of the modern World Wide Web, typed on his keyboard, this is for everyone. And it wasn't a token gesture. It was real, based on everything that we'd done to date. Whether it was our workforce, whether it was our supply chain, whether it was our mascot or the products or the torch relay or the cauldron, everything we tried to do, which was about enlarging the pie and improving the games. For our customers, for our clients, for our employees, for productivity, for better decision making. And because it's the right thing to do. So in a nutshell, there's three real reasons how we created what's called the best games ever so far. It was about understanding. Think differently. It was about leading, inclusive leadership. It's about delivery, actions. Think differently, act differently. I'll leave you with a tool before I hand back. And the tool is pretty simple. If we're really honest with ourselves, we all know people in this world, maybe ourselves, who talk. We also know people who do. Similarly, we know people who take. And we know people who give. And inclusive leadership is about the givers and the doers. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it intellectually, strategically makes sense. It can improve one's own career, but it can improve the organization as well. And that collective intelligence is never more important than now in the world, the diverse world that we find ourselves in. <laughs>